Because uh, when uh, Sreka uh, asked me to give this lecture, he said it's a Laplace lecture. And I said, well, can I ta also talk a little bit about the Bernoullis, since I'm coming from the city of the Bernoullis? He said, yes, it is possible, but uh, Bernoulli is not the real Bayesian. Laplace is the Bayesian. And then I uh, got into the details uh, of the story, and I hope I will uh, can uh, talk about uh, this history before I start with my uh, own lecture. So here is Pierre Simon Laplace. And this is, the, I think, also the only. And uh, you see, uh, Laplace it was quite a character uh, in uh, France because he lived through the revolutionary time. In uh, uh, born 1749 and uh, died 1827. And he uh, was even appointed by Napoleon as a minister of interior, but not for a very long time. Uh, it, uh, I think he was not too happy with him. Um, and uh, uh, so he managed to be member of the academy during all these revolutionary years. And he was uh, uh, concerned with the problem, uh, and you see it here already in the first line, about the treatment of social data, the uncertain the quantification of uh, uncertainty with social data. That was the dream since the early uh, 1700s when uh, uh, the Bernoulli book uh, appeared and uh, uh, the Moavre book. And Laplace made substantial improvements. So um, I cite here from Jacob Bernoulli and uh, this is Jacob, is Jakob Bernoulli, as we would say in Switzerland, since uh, I will talk about this a little bit uh, later. He was born in Basel. Well, uh, since from Jakob Bernoulli, what, um, we find repeated re expressions of hope that this would be true, this analyse, analysis of social data, statements that help explain why many of the greatest mathematical scientists of the century expanded their efforts on the study of games of chance that might otherwise have a seemed frivolous <coughs> scientific pursuit. So I will now show you what Laplace did and why there's a Bayesian inference in some Laplace style. This uh, picture was taken out of for, uh, Stigler's famous uh, Stigler's book in 86, The History of Statistics. And um, I will follow his ideas here. So Laplace was trying to solve the famous problem of inverse probabilities. And here is this uh, citation, the chief conceptual step taken in the 18th century toward the application of probability to quantitative inference involved the inversion of the probability analysis of Jacob, Jacob Bernoulli and de Moivre. So now you see where this origin comes from inverse probability. This first two books on probability theory by Bernoulli and de Moivre started the whole deductive, more or less, uh, a development of probability and then the idea was how we can make inference, how we go <coughs> the other way, how we go back and this is the inverse probability problem. As we usually, usually teach uh, the definition of probabilities, we think there's the so-called Laplace definition of probability. This is the number of favorable cases divided by the number of all possible outcomes, and uh, you know this only applies if all the outcomes are equally likely. But there's also some kind of Laplace causal inference, you might uh, call that way. And uh, according to Stigler, I couldn't read the Laplace work, but in the, that time, but I was following the outline in Stigler. Laplace came uh, to his inference in the following way. Assume that we have n causes, 
and label them A1, A2 until AN, which are all equally likely. So we ha the probability that these causes appear is 1 of n. So P A1 is equal to P A N A1. And then uh, Laplace considers the relation, the realization of e an event E, capital E. And then he says the posterior Laplace probability for uh, any of these n causes, AI, is just just this conditional probability. What is it? There's the probability of AI given E, the event, and this is just the, the ratio of probabilities where P E given H A I is just the other uh, conditional probability divided by all the possible uh, likelihoods, as we would call it today. So all the uh, probabilities of E given the causes H A, and J runs from 1 to N. So in a modern way, we would say the posterior probability of the cause AI is the likelihood of this cause AI divided by the sum of all likelihoods if N possible uh, causes are considered. And that's the uh, base theorem, just uh, with the prior probabilities all put to one of n. And it's interesting how he might have arrived at this formula. It's certainly different than uh, the way um, Bayes did it. And here is. Uh, I think I do something wrong here. I hope this is good. So again, in this notation, how he comes, uh, how he der will uh, derive this formula, how Laplace came up with this formula, is the following way. We have this n causes a1 to a n with equal probability. And then he, he says, according to Stigler, there's a principle. And he calls this principle the following way, that the ratio of conditional probabilities, probability of AI given E divided by HA given E, is the same as the probability of E given AI and the event given the other cause. So the, pos the ratio of posterior probabilities, I would say now, is the same as the ratio of likelihoods. And it, it doesn't mention how he comes to this uh, principle, but if you do that, then it's uh, quite easy to show that uh, if you multiply uh, Aij to the other side, then you get uh, uh, here the following formula, P E give me Ai, and then the ratio of probability of Aij give me E, and the probability of the event E given the other cause H I A J and then you can show that by transforming this ratio here, the second expression here, you end up with the formula Laplace gave uh, of his version of uh, posterior inference if all the uh, causes are equally likely. And uh, as you see, this is this formula here. Today we would just write 1 over n multiplied uh, in the nominator and the denominator. And the, the proof is quite uh, simple. You just uh, uh <coughs> take this ratio here of probabilities and uh, uh, apply the usual definition of conditional probabilities. So it's the joint uh, probability divided by the uh, condition. And here in the denominator, the same thing. Then this cancels out. And then you apply uh, this uh, uh, rule for total probability. And uh, then you just find out that this gives 1 over the sum 
of all the probabilities of the conditional probabilities of E given all the causes. So that's uh, uh, how Laplace ended up uh, with Bayesian inference. And you see it's quite different uh, from the way Bayes did it. And it uh, seems uh, that um, uh, he was not aware about the work of Bayes. Here another uh, interesting view <coughs> on the philosophy of Laplace. He says the following thing in uh, uh, the oeuvres, you see there, his work was published in the middle of the last century, uh, or first, and then uh, it was uh, done uh, anew about 100 years ago, and it came up with a 14 volume set of his work, and the first seven volumes are his uh, Oeuvre, his work, and the other sevens are letters and related uh, pieces. And the last volume is only on probability theory. And in this um, uh, book, he expresses also his philosophical views, and he says, the world is fully determined, uh, but our theories are uncertain. So I think it's a very modern approach to this uh, a problem, and he also says scientific knowledge is only probable. I think it was quite uh, keen to say that, say that about 200 years ago, and he also uh, cites, uh, that's also from Stigler, probability relates partly to our ignorance and partly to our knowledge. So I think it's, uh, 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 this is a, uh, uh, also a nice entry in the Encyclopedia of Statistical Science, where you can read what uh, Laplace has done more on probability. So this uh, uh, ends my introduction on the Laplace side. But now I want to tell you a little bit about even one century earlier, what happened in Basel uh, when Bernoulli, sorry, when Bernoulli started writing his book, uh, the famous um, Ars Conjectandi. So Laplace wrote all his work in French, but Bernoulli did it in uh, Latin. And uh, the story is a quite interesting one. And it is not only one Bernoulli which is involved there is the whole dynasty here of Bernoullis, as you can see that. And uh, in Basel, uh, there is, uh, right now, is um, 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 we have um, our edition, the Bernoulli edition. They are working, several scientists are working on that. And if you're interested, you can take a copy of this. It tells you about the work, unfortunately, it's in German. And uh, they are now editing uh, all the Bernoulli works. And not only of Jacob Bernoulli here, but uh, all the following Bernoullis. And uh, as you can see here, there are three big Bernoullis, and there are five smaller ones. <laughs> so the big ones are Jacob, John, and Daniel in the middle here. And there are the five other ones, which is one, two, Three, uh, three, four, and I think it's uh, Niklas here. I'm not sure he was uh, a big scientist. But the uh, Bernoullis uh, more or less dominated the Basel University for one century. So Jacob was the first one who got the chair of mathematics around 1680. And I think he started immediately writing on his probability theory. And he died in 1705 without completing his work. And then his brother took over the chair in uh, Basel. But his brother was, meanwhile, professor of mathematics in Groningen, which is now Netherlands. And he came to Basel, and then he completed uh, the work uh, of his uh, brother with the help, probably, of Jacob 
Jacob Herrmann. And this was our common friend and also professor in mathematics in Italy and other parts. So finally, the book, The Ars Connectandi, appeared in uh, 1713, so eight years after Jacob Bernoulli died. And um, if you have been to Basel and uh, we made their uh, famous ba Bernoulli walking tour, then you can see all the houses where they have uh, lived and, uh, and uh, where the uh, plague is the uh, for, the, uh, for their graves. You can still visit them. So, um, because it was also moved around uh, in 200 years, nothing is the same in any city as you might see here now in Bangalore as well. So, uh, this is the, the uh, a story about uh, Jacob and uh, John, the two brothers. There was another brother, the Niklaus, which was a painter, but he never uh, got famous. And he, the father of both probably was a Huguenot who came from France, from northern France, via Frankfurt to Basel. And they were successful traders, and he wanted the, the sons to become uh, businessmen, but they refused and they decided to study mathematics and uh, the father was very unhappy about that so they had done it secretly and uh, the story goes that those two brothers together with Jacob Herman were the first one to understand differential calculus at that age because this differential calculus was just invented by Leibniz and Newton. Newton came from physics and Leibniz came from uh, the approach, what is the tangency you can put on any function. And the, all the notation we use now today about the integrals and differential are symbols from Leibniz. And they think uh, they were the first one to understand that and could, uh, so he could write this uh, So you see it's written in Latin and it has uh, the first proof of what we call now the law of uh, large numbers. And uh, the last page is here is with an example. And I will uh, briefly explain the example, as it's also done in Stigler. Uh, and you see, he writes down some numbers. And after he comes up with a very big number, uh, it seems that uh, Jacob Panoli was really uh, disappointed and he, he stopped writing the book. So that's the end of the book. After the, the only example probably again, he stopped. So he, uh, 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 Stigler calls it the Bernoulli's failure and, um, and it's not quite clear. Maybe he, uh, for him it was a failure because uh, uh, Bernoulli tried to uh, develop principle so f for probability to apply it in social science. So it was quite a, a modern view of doing it. But when I read now the Stiglitz stuff, um, that's uh, out of his book. So in our modern notation, what was uh, Jacob Bernoulli trying to show? And what we usually are taught is that he proved the so-called law of uh, uh, weak law of large numbers, which is written here as equation number one. So that's the probability that the empirical average uh, deviates from the unknown proportion p uh, is larger than epsilon is one over c plus one, uh, one over uh, a certain constant. And that's a reformulation actually of um, probability inequality which uh, Daniel, uh, sorry, which Jacob Bernoulli really tried to solve and that's the following thing that is actually an odds ratio as you would call it today. It's the probability that uh, uh, this empirical mean stays within epsilon boundaries is larger than c times probability of the opposite event that uh, the empirical mean stays outside this epsilon uh, channel. And if, if you write this now, this event A, as uh, 
the absolute deviation of x over n minus p uh, smaller than epsilon, then what this inequality is actually saying is that the probability of a divided by the probability of 1 minus a, the contrary, is larger than c. So what Bernoulli really wanted to show is that the odds ratio is larger than a certain constant c. And uh, that was his intention to prove. So there's a, a connection with the Bernoulli lecture, the little bit of a Bayesian uh, analysis, at least the Bayesian concept as we have it now with the, with the odds ratio. Bernoulli wanted to find a capital N, a number of uh, observations for which it is morally certain. So it was for him some kind of moral uh, question that the ratio r over r plus s is recovered up to an error prob uh, epsilon of 1 over r, r plus s. So he had the idea, you have an urn which has uh, um, r uh, balls of one color and S of the other color and uh, uh, his question was is how large you have to take a sample that I can make sure that the ratio of uh, balls in these urns are exactly R over R plus S. And he had in mind some kind of uh, fertility seeds which uh, grow. And uh, in his uh, notation, he assumes that n is a multiple of t, which is r plus s, uh, the number of uh, uh, their balls in this urn. And then n is, uh, capital N is n times t, and np is n times r, and then epsilon n. So <coughs> the whole proof in his book is essentially about this odds ratio. Um, that the odds of this event is uh, smaller than epsilon is uh, 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 how large you should take the n that the, the odds will stay in this band is about say a certain number like c he takes c hundred ten thousand or hundred thousand and then he uh, that's exactly <coughs> what he did with his uh, his um, uh, numerical analysis, the, the part of the book, the last two pages of the book which I've shown to you is he did this calculation and said, well, how big has to be the uh, samples, the number of samples, if the odds ratio should be thousands. So a thousand would uh, say that R uh, the, is the count, uh, are the siege which are fertile, and S would be, for instance, the number of seeds which are not fertile. Uh, so this is the content. And epsilon would be 1 over 50. So this is the arrow <coughs> band. So with <coughs> this here. So how large uh, you have to take a sample that you, uh, you are sure that uh, the ratio in your urn is just uh, th as 3 over 2. And then he found out that the n should be 25,000 25, observation at least. And if you take uh, C, the odds ratio 10,000, you should take a sample of 31,000. And if it's 100,000, then it's 36,000. And Stigler, or we don't know why, uh, uh, with, uh, why Jacob Bernoulli really stopped at this point, he thinks he stopped because he said this number is ridiculous large. For that, at that uh, period, about 300 years ago, when he first uh, started doing this, he said uh, this is too large because in, uh, at his time, the people thought there is about 3,000 stars in the skies. And the population of Basel was not six or seven million as now in Bangalore, but it was maybe uh, 10,000 uh, people. So it was, uh, this number he calculated was far beyond uh, what the people could grasp at that time. And so probably he thought he did something wrong. And uh, if you go in the book of Feller, and uh, 
uh, look for a sharper inequality, then you're down to 6,600 observations. But I thought it's quite interesting that Bernoulli was actually thinking in terms of odds ratios, which is not so popular in our days. Okay, so that's so far uh, what I wanted to say uh, for this classical uh, period of probability theory. And now let's turn to the modern uh, theory of Bayesian inference in linear models and time series. So you had some introduction already, but I want to start simple with this time series business. And that's now what we have to turn and do today. Uh, autoregressive processes. So, <coughs> uh, what I try to do today is uh, we'll show you how autoregressive processes are used in econometrics and can be put into a linear regression framework. Let's start with the most simple problem. So we consider a stationary time series xt, which has a zero mean and variance sigma squared. And uh, the autoregressive process is given by xt uh, equals to rho times xt minus 1 plus epsilon t. And the data we are collecting, the time series, in the, is in the vector x, x1 to xt. And then you see the likelihood function is given by this expression here. I can read that. It's just the likelihood function for a normal distribution. You have the 2 pi part in the beginning, then there is sigma squared, and the ex exponential part, which is just uh, the difference of all the observations, and so on. And if you assume an uh, informative prior distribution, and we want to stay in the so-called conjugate framework, and uh, what does conjugate framework mean? I hope you know by now what it is. If you assume a certain form of the prior distribution, then conjugacy means that the posterior distribution is from the same family of distributions. So here we assume that this parameter rho is only one parameter here, and the precision, which is the inverse of the variance here, is uh, from the family of normal gamma, uh, normal gamma distributions. Sorry, I see have made here a misprint. That's uh, here sigma minus two, and x zero is a starting value. So actually, we also do here a conditioning on the starting value of the time series. And normal gamma means that, in the following uh, sense, I will uh, come to that. I explain the the. The four parameters is a four parametric uh, family. And um, I explained that par in a minute. But the posterior distribution is also to come from this family of distribution. And we write in the following way rho and uh, the precision sigma minus 2, given the data x, is also a gamma, normal gamma distribution with the four parameters. And you see there stay the same, except that the one star will now change to a double star notation. So these four parameters here with a one star are the parameters of the prior distribution, and the four parameters with the two stars are the so-called hyperparameters, as they are also called, of the posterior distribution. And what does this posterior or this normal gamma family mean? It means the following thing, that uh, Conditional on sigma squared, the rho is a normal distribution with the parameter rho star, with the mean rho double star, and variance h double star. And the precision is a gamma distribution, a gamma distribution uh, with the two parameters s double star and n double star. 
And this is actually not the, uh, the gamma distribution as, is, as you see them uh, in many books. It's the so-called gamma 2 distribution, and that was defined by, uh, uh, by uh, people in the 60s uh, as, a, as a simpler notation for the gamma distribution. And interesting now is how you c can you calculate these uh, uh, parameters of the posterior distribution. And here we find the following principle, that the posterior precision, let's start from the bottom line here, the posterior precision, H double star inverse, is just the sum of the precisions of the prior distribution, which is H star inverse, plus the precision of the data, X prime X. The sum of squares of the X as here is just the precision of the data. And that's a principle which is true for all Bayesian inference. If you have an informative prior distribution, that precisions add up in this way. So we will always write it in that way. And what you also see here, that the posterior mean, rho star, is the so-called average between two location parameters. The prior location parameter, rho star, weighted average now here with the rho star. And you see the weights are actually are the precisions of the prior and the data. So H star inverse here. Oh, here's one star too much, I see. It was freshly typed for this lecture here, so we have still some misprints here. And so the precision is always the weight uh, for the uh, location parameters, which is here the prior mean, and here it's the data mean. The upper part can be written also as x prime x, and uh, we and rho hat plus h then inverse with a, s a symbol and. Uh, the sum of the precision stays the same. So that's the simple, in, uh, sim most simple inference in time series analysis. For instance, for this autoregressive process for order one, if you are assuming the formative prior. <coughs> so here are some more of these uh, parameters. We are not finished. Sorry, I see some more misprints here. So the posterior degrees of freedom for the gamma distribution is n double star. And this is also a sum of the prior degrees of freedom, n star plus t, the number of observations. And then we have for a deviation from um, their classical uh, estimate of the variance. So uh, we write it in the following way, the posterior sum of square, which is essentially n double star s square double star. This posterior sum of squares consists of th three factors. The one is the prior sum of squares, which is n star s star square, plus the error sum of squares, ESS, and the so-called factor d, which I call the discrepancy factor. And the discrepancy factor measures the distance of your prior mean from your maximum likelihood location, rho hat, which is in this case also the ordinary least squares location, in a certain metric, which is this uh, uh, expression here in the denominator. So what you would expect are the first two terms, the, the posterior sum of squares are, is always a sum of error sum of squares plus what you think uh, uh, your variance or your precision is a priori. But surprisingly, here this factor comes in. And this uh, says the following thing. This discrepancy vector uh, is a, some kind of penalty term. So if you're far away with your prior guess from what, what the data is telling you, that the row hat, then this uh, penalty term can be large. And so you add uncertainty to your inference. And uh, if you're close, 
than as we usually hope to be, then this uh, part will be small and uh, uh, so you're not adding to your uncertainty. So the error sum of squares is just the sum of squares of the uh, data uh, errors which are defined as xt minus rho hat xt minus 1 which is the simple maximum likelihood estimator and you see here this the rho hat is just the auto covariance uh, uh, estimator as we know that is xt times xt minus 1 divided by the sum of squares and um, uh, as I have already mentioned that the posterior distribution is uh, a normal distribution uh, conditional on sigma squared but unconditionally this uh, distribution is a t is a t distribution so if you integrate out sigma um, then uh, this uh, is the so-called so -called marginal distribution for a row and uh, this t distribution consists of three parameters rho double star which is the same as we had just above the weighted average between the maximum likelihood and the prior location then the scale parameter of the t distribution which is s double star h star and the degrees of freedom of the t distribution which is n and two star and n two star as I have told you is just the uh, number of observation plus the prior degrees of freedom for the uh, precision and here I introduce the following notation this t distribution has the moments rho double star and this variance which comes here so uh, the, this uh, brackets with, or with the slash here uh, indicates uh, a, a distribution with mean and variance of this kind. You see that the variance is close to the uh, scale parameter of the t, uh, t distribution. You have only to correct by the degrees of freedom and if the degrees of freedom is large then uh, there is essentially no difference but in small samples you see a difference. For the precision there is no uh, a special marginal distribution since it is given as a marginal distribution it's a gamma distribution with the scale parameter sigma 2 star and uh, prior degrees of freedom n double star and the predictive distribution can be also calculated because we want to make forecasts with the time series so standing at point capital T we want to make a one step prediction to the next observation xt plus 1 so how we calculate uh, this, it's just rho times the present value of the time series which is xt plus an unknown future error term epsilon t plus 1. And this predictive distribution is just a t distribution as well. So you see that the uh, predictive distribution has the property that doesn't, doesn't contain any parameters of the posterior distribution anymore because we are waiting over the posterior distribution all the possible uh, models of the future. And uh, uh, so we come up with a t distribution where, which has the center rho, t, uh, rho double star times xt. So the posterior mean times the present observation then we have a scale uh, parameter of the t distribution which is the s square double star times m star m double star and n du uh, double star n double star is the degrees of freedom that's the same as the, the posterior distribution what the only thing which changes is uh, the variance of uh, the future uh, observation so we essentially have a one in front here so it's a little bit larger than uh, uh, what we got in the posterior distribution and uh, there are basically two are a predictive distribution the unconditional one where we have integrated out their uh, sigma squared and the conditional one on sigma squared which is the usual normal distribution 
So uh, as a general rule, uh, have in mind, if you have a normal gamma distribution and you integrate out the sigma squared or the precision sigma inverse squared of this uh, normal gamma distribution, you get a t-distribution. And that's the uh, basic idea of uh, this Bayesian modeling, Bayesian linear modeling for the most simple case as is shown here. And we will do that uh, also for the more, more complicated cases. The whole thing, uh, as I've shown you here, is simplified in the so-called non-informative autoregressive model. Non-informative, we understand the following prior distribution. It's not a normal gamma distribution, as I have shown you, but it is a, um, a prior distribution which is proportional to the precision. So sigma inverse squared. So this is the so-called Jeffrey priors. And uh, this is uh, uh, valid for all the rows um, uh, where <coughs> between minus 1 and plus 1 and positive variance. And uh, the model can also be written just as a, a normal distribution with rho times xt minus 1 and uh, constant variance sigma squared. And you can consider the classical inference, what you, uh, is usually done in econometrics, as a special case of the normal gamma distribution. The normal gamma is saying here, in the non-informative case, the mean is rho hat, just the maximum likelihood estimator. The variance is just the sum of squares inverse. That's the scale parameter. And, um, and then we have uh, the scale parameter for the gamma distribution, which is S squared. That's different from the scale parameter of the normal. And then we have the number degrees, of free degrees of freedom, which is T minus 1. And the S squared the, uh, uh, is the so-called we have two variance estimators, one the maximum likelihood estimator, and the other one is here the unbiased estimator. And here we have the unbiased estimator. And the marginal distribution, we can calculate the same way. It's just the t distribution, again, as we had before, is t minus, uh, t minus 1 degrees of freedom, and the ratio s squared over x prime x is just the scale parameter. <coughs> this t distribution is has moments rho hat and variance sigma squared rho, which is just the error sum of squares divided by t minus 3. So you see here if we have another loss of degrees of freedom, so you get a little bit larger in the variance. If, uh, if we just consider the moments. And uh, the gamma distribution is essentially a chi-square distribution with uh, sigma hat squared, which is the maximum likelihood estimate of the variance here and the degrees of freedom. Then we can have informative and non-informative forecasts of the time series. The informative forecasts are, oops, what is this? Sorry. So we have here uh, the xt plus 1, the next observation given here uh, as a predictive uh, distribution for in the non-informative case, which is just uh, the present value multiplied with the maximum likelihood estimator rho hat. And then we have the scale parameter s squared m double star, where m double star is just 1 over x t squared over x prime x. And many people know that from the classical deviation uh, or derivation of the product. And uh, the degrees of freedom uh, is t <coughs> minus 1. Sorry about that. So this is the simple um, forecast. And I mean, can do the same. I will give you an example of this later on. So let's ha uh, look at the example. 
let's have here an autoregressive <coughs> process of order one. <coughs> and we are trying to analyze US consumption. Consumption monthly real data from February 1990 to uh, September 1999. And we are analyzing growth rates of consumption. So CT is uh, given by the difference of the logs of uh, real consumption. And we do the following um, practical analysis. We assume a very simple prior distribution for uh, the regression. So what we do is we say the current uh, growth rates is alpha plus beta CT minus 1 plus an error term. Sorry, epsilon T here. And uh, that's the model now. So we have added a constant here. And for this model, we assume a prior distribution which is centered on the origin, 0, 0. And we assume the following uh, precision for the I'm sorry, it's a variance matrix for the beta, which is just the diagonal matrix of, call it here, this should be a diagonal matrix here, which is very non-informative in the first component for the mean. So we, the variance is very high, about 1,000 here, and it's zero in the off-diagonal, and the variance of the uh, autoregressive component for rho, which we, was rho in the previous model, we call it now beta here, is just one. Because this would cover more or less, if it's the variance of one, uh, the reasonable range where we expect this autoregressive component, namely to be somewhere between minus one and plus one. And uh, to make it uh, uh, acceptable for the scale, we divide by the variance of CT. That's the variance of the time series. So then you don't have to worry about if you're estimating these models in uh, uh, growth rates or in percentages, for instance. In this case, the variance of the, uh, the growth rate was about uh, 2.24 uh, times 10 minus 6. So you see it's very small because we haven't multiplied the growth rates by hundreds. And for the uh, precision, we do the following uh, gamma distribution. We think that the prior scale uh, variance is about uh, uh, the variance of the time series divided by 10. And the degrees of freedom is 1. So the degrees of freedom n star just tells you what is the value of this prior information. And this prior information is essentially one additional uh, extra observation. And why we divide here by 10? Uh, this is uh, saying that uh, for the residual variance, or the residual precision, we expect uh, a reduction of the variance of the time series by roughly uh, 90%. So if we div divide by 10, I expect something like an R square of such a model in the, in this, in the size of R square 0.9. And this is the idea of dividing by 10 here. So you think uh, we can make a pretty good fit by such an autoregressive model. Now let's see how this uh, affects our estimates. First, we summarize the data by the OLS estimates, by the least squares estimate or the maximum likelihood estimates, which is here 0 0.0156 and 0.335 here for the autoregressive component. And the residuals are very small. It's 1.985 times 10 minus 6. So you see, we get a little bit of reduction of the variance of what we got here. And the posterior uh, distribution, assuming this as a prior distribution, is uh, given here as 0 0.00157 and 0 0.332. Uh, so you see, there is not too much difference for this. Uh, uh, prior distribution. The impact is uh, small for the regression coefficients. And here we have the posterior covariance matrix. And you see there here is uh, there are also very small elements. 
2.24 times 10 minus 10 and 2.2 times 10 minus 6. So this is not uh, very informative. If you take just the, uh, the standard deviations of the diagonal elements, then you see uh, if this uh, posterior means which we have estimated are important or not. And you see here the standard deviations are quite small. So it's uh, rather a significant estimate for the a slope, uh, which is the autoregressive component, and the rather uh, uh, about the same size of the coefficient for the um, intercept. And here uh, we have the second part of the uh, posterior distribution, which is the gamma distribution for the precision. And we get here 1.955 times times minus 6. Uh, and uh, degrees of freedom are 116, so we have 115 observation plus one degree of freedom from the prior distribution. So uh, this uh, just uh, tells you that we are pretty close to uh, the estimate, which is from the Royal Last estimate. And we can do a prediction. So what we can do is make a, uh, for the next observation a predictive density. And if you summarize this, um, uh, by mean and variance, uh, then uh, uh, we get 4.66 times 10 minus. This is a very small quantity, actually, for the growth rate, so it's not not too much of interest, and uh, the variance is uh, rather small here as well. Uh, finally, the program will give you an output for the marginal likelihood, and the marginal likelihood can be used. If you want uh, to test, and I will talk about this later on, uh, to test between different models. So for instance, between an autoregressive model of order one or of order two, and so on. So you can calculate different uh, uh, marginal likelihoods. And I guess now I can make my break. Is that true? So and uh, we have a break, or are you taking over? And I will continue with things like that in the afternoon.